Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to Intersect, where DOD, academia, and industry meet. Our topic today is engineering tactical and AI-enabled systems. My name is Shane McGraw, Outreach Team Lead here at the Software Engineering Institute. My featured guest today is Dr. Grace Lewis. Grace is a lead for our tactical and AI-enabled systems initiative here at the SEI. Welcome, Grace. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. To start, can you give us a quick overview of what the Tactical and AI-Enabled Systems Initiative actually is? Sure. Um, the SEI is a federally funded research and development center, or FFRDC. Uh, we're the Software Engineering FFRDC. And our group focuses on software engineering exactly for what you said for tactical and AI-enabled systems. Uh, so we focus on software engineering for tactical systems. These are systems that are deployed at the tactical edge where you don't have the luxury of having access to great networks, to great servers. Um, we focus on, on the software engineering of AI enabled systems. How, it is, how does the introduction of AI and in particular machine learning, how does it change the practice of software engineering? And then we're interested in the intersection of the two, which is how do you deploy systems at the edge that contain AI components? So, Grace, you've done this work for a, quite a bit of time. So, start with tactical cloud lots out mm -hmm. uh, work and stuff. What are some of the resources uh, that the people can right. go to to find some of the, the works? I know you got done a bunch of blog posts, web webcasts in the past. Is there a central right. place people can go for follow up? Sure. So, so obviously, the 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 easiest place would be to to go to to my my staff page at the uh, on the SEI website. But in general, the work, our work and in, in, in our focus on tactical systems started like just like you said with uh, with tactical cloudlets. So definitely looking for tactical cloudlets, and how we develop that as a way to enable people that are working in the field to kind of take a little piece of the cloud with them to be able to deploy uh, these cloudlets with the information that they need, with the computation, with the data that they need, and to be able to secure securely connect to these cloudlets uh, in the field. So definitely tactical cloudlets. We've also done work on IoT security, which is another area of, of edge computing. And more recently, we've focused on, on edge AI and how, how um, algorithms and models need to be adjusted to be able to be deployed on very small uh, foreign factor devices with limited computation and resources. So the next follow-up question that is, why is developing solutions for these for those operating in, in tactical mm -hmm. environments so important? Well, and unfortunately, these these folks are, are very. I believe they're very underserved by the by the commercial marketplace. It's not an area where you know where where the money is, right? And they and these are people that operate in very, very not only dangerous but just difficult conditions. So it, you can think of soldiers, of course, but also first responders, medics, anybody that operates in the field that has to do their job while they're disconnected from the cloud. And so what we want to do is really help these, these people that have to work in, in these conditions. So a lot of our work has focused on, on optimizing, uh, optimizing connectivity for people that work in this space, being able to provide them the resources that they need, and also while also adjusting to some of the challenges that they need to face, which include also high cognitive load, obviously, because if you're, if you're performing a mission, uh, whether it's humanitarian or, or tactical, um, you can't really be focusing on on 25 different screens and, and, and pushing 25 different buttons, right? So everything has to be very simple for you to operate in the field. So definitely done a lot of work in this area. Great. So Intersect was started to, to kind of highlight job openings at the SCI, give people a sneak peek of what it's like to work mm -hmm. with the SCI. So we know mm -hmm. your team is hiring a, a software engineer. So the, the follow-up question is, what does the day-to-day -day workload look like for a software engineer at the Software Engineering Institute? Right. So um, in general, uh, and in particular, our initiative, we work on two different types of projects. Uh, we work on research projects. We work on applied research projects. We receive funding to conduct applied research. And we also work on, on customer projects. The difference between the two is that when we work on research projects, we're, we're developing, you know, cutting edge research to address some of the problems in our case that people at the edge are facing or people that are trying to develop AI systems. However, um, we also make, need to make sure that this research, that the results of our research make it into, into DOD, government, civil industry organizations that want to use our practices. So we also work on what is called customer projects, which is taking that research and those results 
and moving them into, into organizations so that they can use. So software engineers on our projects, um, if they're working on a research project, they're more like, they're very likely uh, developing prototypes, uh, conducting experiments, working with really cutting edge technology with the latest things, uh, just to make sure that, that the research ideas that are coming out of our group are actually feasible, they're implementable, they're viable. And then if they're working on customer projects, they're taking the things that they have developed in the context of, of research projects and, and taking them into organizations, whether it's helping organizations develop their own prototypes, whether it's doing co-development with organizations, or sometimes it's even um, more like, I would say more like, more like training or coaching in the sense that let's help organizations create or have this capability internally so that they don't need us anymore, that they can have that capability and just keep on doing it repeatedly. Terrific. So you started your career out as a software engineer, from what I recall. Yep. What, what's the typical profile for a software engineer? Where, where are they? What are they looking at at school? What what coding languages right. do they know? Internships, mm -hmm. stuff of that nature. Sure. So I would say that the profile of a of a software engineer uh, on our team. I mean, depending how many years of experience that they have, of course. But typically, uh, an undergraduate degree in either computer science or or software engineering. Uh, some of our team members have just engineering degrees, but they really focused on software development or became really interest, interested in software development early in their in their careers. And so that's a, as far as education. Um, as far as experience, we have a very diverse team, uh, not only in terms of experience, but also in terms of gender, in terms of, of nationality. Um, so um, I would say our, our youngest team member uh, graduated in summer of last year and probably I'm the oldest team member <laughs> and I'm not going to say how old I am. <laughs> um, but uh, but in and currently our our most of our projects are either Python, uh, Java, or or C But you know sometimes, like I said, we we we're really privileged to be working with very cutting edge technologies and new things. And so, for example, um, it would we've we've worked with Scala before. We've worked with Camel. Like we've done a lot of looking at a lot of languages and technologies in our on our team. Great. So obviously both employees of the SEI, uh, we are, uh, I'm looking mm -hmm. at what's your, your favorite part of working at SEI. My personal favorite and something that I'm so appreciative mm -hmm. of is the, the work-life mm -hmm. balance, the, the flexibility and job with, with, you know, having a family and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kids of various age. What, what's some of your favorite things that you, you really appreciate working at the SEI about? So on the personal side, I have to agree uh, wholeheartedly with you. Um, my kids were born while I was working at the SEI, and now they're both teenagers. So having that flexibility has been extremely important for me, uh, and it's been here, you know, from the start. Not not just because now we're kind of in this hybrid environment, right? But right. just in general. So work life balance is definitely uh, has been a, a, a big plus uh, for me, and I think it's a big plus for anybody that that has a family. Um, as professionally, uh, so. From a, from a development or from a software engineering perspective, uh, just the fact that every project that we work on is different. Um, every project that we start requires me to learn something completely different, something that I've never used before, whether it's a different language or it's a different tool or just a different a different field. Like obviously, you know, machine learning is something that that is new to me. That's that that was I was not part of my of my background, and and just the fact that I get to learn that is is very is very exciting. From a researcher perspective, because I am on the research, I'm a, I am the, on the research track. I would say uh, the best thing is is our proximity to to campus, to Carnegie Mellon University, uh, to know that we can make these connections very easily. That we get to work with top researchers in the field, um, of being starstruck when you meet the person that you know that wrote the books that you that you studied with. It's 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 pretty amazing. Right. So you mentioned earlier the F, the SEI is an FFRDC, federally funded research and development center. What's your favorite part of working at an NFF or DC? What, what separates us from industry and uh, other right. acad academic institutions? Well, I mean, first of all, it's, it's the mission, right? It's the mission that we're, we're making software engineering better for, for our nation, for our Department of Defense, for, for, um, for government, for civil agencies in general. So we're, we're improving the, the practice of software engineering. Um, what makes it different from industry is really, I, I think it's the variety of projects that we get involved with. Um, I know that not all industry is the same, but you often, I mean, I came from industry, right? And you, you tend to work with a, with, a, with a limited set of technologies because there are things that have been stabilized within the, within the organization. Uh, the SEI is really at that 
it's not industry, it's not academia, it's like right in the middle. So it's it's great to have to have, like I said, the, the benefit of being able to do research, but also of doing applied research, of knowing that you're solving a real problem. So that is definitely, a, I think, is a, a plus for me. Terrific. So last question, you, you mentioned machine learning, how mm-hmm. it's something you learned on the job, wasn't around when you know when you started at, at the SCI. How no has way. AI and ML changed the careers of software engineers? So it is it is changing because it's it's becoming, I mean, it's not that machine learning is new. I mean, machine learning has existed for a long time. It's just that it's it's become pervasive because I think that we finally have the, the data that we need to be do, able to do uh, things that are meaningful. Um, traditionally, um, machine learning and models, I would say, and AI in general, you know, it's uh, it's been something that has been approached mostly by by data scientists, uh, by more recently by ML engineers, but people that have a very strong uh, mathematical and statistics uh, background. Um, but what happens is that nowadays, um, some organizations can have the luxury of having you know dedicated machine learning teams, but in other organizations, especially you know smaller smaller businesses, smaller companies, smaller organizations, um, they can have the luxury to have these specialized individuals. So a lot of software engineers are starting to to learn some of these tools, to learn some of these techniques, and the the market is also progressing and is, is making is making software engineers. Um, or at least I would say the machine learning concepts more more accessible to software engineers, but it's definitely changing. I mean, I, I, it's it's hard to imagine an organization that is not embracing machine learning for something to make to make sense out of some data. So it's definitely, I wouldn't call it an emerging technology. It's just that it's it's something that I think that sooner or later any software engineer is going to encounter. So are our colleges and universities embracing this too? I know you every year you put mm-hmm. on some, some colleagues the the software. Right. Uh, engineering educators workshop at the SCI yeah. attendance from around the world. Is that mm-hmm. something that these educators are embracing? And how, how has it affected them? Oh yeah, abs- absolutely. And thanks for the for the for the plug, uh, Shane, because yeah. that's something that I really like about my job as well. The fact that we get to or every year we get to organize this great workshop with with in- instructors or, or educators in software engineering from around the world. And I would say that for the past three years, we've had something related to machine learning because. Um, they're desperate to learn because what the what the people that are hiring from their universities are saying is, you know, we need more people with these skills. Right. So they come to the SEI trying to to figure out, you know, what are what is the best way to introduce, you know, machine learning topics in a in a curriculum that is already super full, and they get the opportunity to to discuss with other educators on how to do this. So definitely. Um, large, large interest in this in this space from from educators. Terrific. So next question was wondering about what can someone joining the TAS initiative, which is your team, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. inspect in terms of relationships in your team, types of assignments, things of that nature? What what can they truly expect once they once someone would join the join your group? Right. So there are lots of different teams at the at the SEI. I would say that something that characterizes our team is from the from the professional and work perspective is that we're very hands on. Uh, we're very prototype oriented. We don't like inventing or creating something without having a, a, a counterpart prototype or some type of software that says, "Yep, this is this is not just an idea. It's a good one because I can because I can do it." So definitely, from the professional side, lots of software development, lots of lots of cutting cutting edge technologies. Um, from the personal side, we're a very very close team. Uh, we 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 you know, we we connect socially uh, inside and outside of, of work. Uh, we all know each other's families. We all have our kids, you know, play with each other. Well, I don't play anymore, but you know what I mean? Uh, we know each other. Um, at noon, uh, we play board games um, in our lab. So we definitely, it's a it's a fun team. It's a very diverse team, which is also something that I'm very proud of. Um, and I just, and I think that that it's a job where you can have fun, like I said, not only professionally, but also personally and socially. And what's the, what is the hiring process like at the SCI? Is it, uh, face-to-face interviews are we conducting phone mm-hmm. interviews these days How, a little insight into that process Greg are they interviewing yeah. with, with colleagues that they would be working with or is it just management absolutely so um obviously the, the the pandemic situation has has changed our hiring process a little bit so uh, the initial we usually do an initial phone screen uh it's me and one of my colleagues uh, just to get a feel uh, because it's two ways, right? I mean, not only does 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 the person have to be fit for the work, but the work has to be fit for the person. Right. So that's like that initial conversation where we 
we figure out if there's a match. Um, if that goes well, um, there is a there is a coding test, um, and the the rigor or I would say complexity of it depends on on the position that that you're applying for. Um, some are very you know really programming focused. Others have a little bit of design component in them. If we're looking for somebody with more experience, um, if the coding test goes well, then we have um, well if we were in person and maybe we will be in person soon. Here, um, we would have uh, you know face to face interviews usually. Uh, just team interviews, two two team members asking questions, and uh, and the interview. Each team has a like a different perspective or a different focus, so it doesn't seem like repetitive. Some uh, some uh, some interviews are going to look at code quality of the of the code that was submitted. Um, other teams might be looking at a little bit more of you know higher level you know thinking design. Um, obviously, the the whole match for the for the team. So, and that's, that's it. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple, uh, pretty straightforward. And despite the pandemic situation, we've been able to handle it pretty well. Great. So again, the, the position we're talking about is a software engineer within the tactical and AI enabled systems initiative here at the SEI. Uh, if you have an interest in that position, go to the SEI website, sei.cmu.edu. You'll see a, a tab for careers there. It's one of the current job postings and you can start the process there. If you're not interested or it's not a fit for you, we do ask that you share the archive of this or to interested colleagues or just share the video so we can get the word out as we'd like to get this position filled. Uh, so let's do some rapid fire, Grace, to get a chance to know you a little bit better. Someone wants to work sure. at the SEI. Who were your career it. influencers? Whew, my my career influencers. So here, I mean, I do not want to date myself, but I'm going to yeah. have to. So, so when I... Um, when I was growing up, I I thought I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, I I imagined myself wearing the you know the lab coats and the and the beakers and, and mostly I would say chem chemistry was part of my career. Um, in my junior year in college, uh, they offered the first ever uh, computing or I what was it called? Maybe it was just programming class, but the first ever it was the first computers that ever came to the school, and. Um, it was a pure coincidence uh, the elective that I wanted to take, it didn't fit with my schedule. And they said, well, there's this brand new, there's this brand new class. Do you want to be a part of it? And I said, sounds interesting. And it was like mind blowing for me. It's like, you know, forget chemistry. This is, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. And, and that didn't change. Um, I, I started out in, I would say in, in embedded systems, then I moved more into more of like the traditional, more information systems. But but my career, I mean, I've had just some amazing bosses throughout my career. Like I can't think of a boss that I would have ever said, oh my goodness, I don't want to go into work today. I've, I've really been very, very, very lucky to have very smart, very understanding and, and bosses that really push, push me hard. So no no specific names, but just I would say that I I've been very lucky to work with people that I have not only admired, but that have helped me throughout my career. And like you said earlier, to, to work at a university where you're meeting people that, that write the books, it, it's such a unique and uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing. Yeah. All right. Your favorite book. Uh, so here's the thing. I don't I don't um, remember we talked about work life balance. Yeah. When I leave work, my work ends. So when I read, I read for fun. Yeah. Uh, I read lots of science fiction. I read lots of fantasy um, right now, I'm obsessed with Brandon Sanderson, and I've been start, I've been reading absolutely all his books. Terrific. When you knew you wanted a STEM career, what approximate mm -hmm. age range? When, when did, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, STEM career. When you approximately yeah. knew that was that was your your calling? Oh, I ooh, really early on. I would say middle school. Like I said, that's when I started becoming interested in in science. That's when like science became real. When you know when labs were part of classes, which is not that usually doesn't happen in elementary school. It's more in middle school that you start getting you know the lab experience. So definitely, science in general for me started in middle school. And uh, I would say the technology piece of STEM it started like I said in my junior year in in high school, and it hasn't it hasn't changed. Must listen to technology podcast. <laughs> I don't do podcasts. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't do. I am much more of a visual uh, learner, right? Uh, rather than auditory, I can't even do. I can't even do audiobooks. I I've, I've tried, and I'm driving in the car, and when I, I all of a sudden I've missed five minutes of the book. I I that's just just not not the way I learn. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, but but one of my favorite, I would say tech. I would say blogs. Um, I love Netflix. Netflix has a tech blog. 
Okay. And they're so open about everything. They, they're open about their successes. They're open about their failures. And I really like, I really like um, that. That is, that is more what I'm interested in. Netflix is the one that, that comes to mind as a, as a very good uh, uh, tech blog to me. Okay, last one. We'll, then we'll let you off the hot, hot seat here. Will mm -hmm. self-driving cars be the standard in five years? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, I, I wish. I wish because I, I think that would make it easier. But it's just, it's just such a complex. I mean, I don't, I don't, I know that a lot of people do understand this, but I, I, it's, it's such a complex problem. It's such that the, the fact that these self-driving cars have tons of sensors trying to capture so much information from the environment so they can make the correct decision. Um, I think that the fact that, that you have to, that it's such a safety problem, I think it's, it's, that's why I think it's going to be a challenge because I mean, obviously vehicles have to be safe. Um, will it happen eventually? Absolutely. Within five years? I don't think so. There's still a lot of things that we have to solve. Terrific. La any last words, Grace? Are you open to people reaching out to you here on LinkedIn to talk about the job or other recommendations? Uh, any last part? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would I would love to answer any questions about working at the SEI, about software engineering, about STEM careers. Um, I'm also very active in in women in computing. Uh, so any anything related to any of those topics, happy to connect over over LinkedIn, of course. Grace, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Folks, that's going to wrap up the, this edition of Intersect. Again, the position we were highlighting is a software engineer here at the SEI. Go to our website, click on the careers tab, and it'll take you to this position. Again, if it's not a fit for you, we ask that you do share the archive so people can get to see what's, what it's like to work here at the SEI. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.